morning. I'm Cam McDougall. I'm the medical director for neurosurgery at uh, Swedish Neuroscience Institute. And we're here with another edition of the John Jane Lectureship. Uh, happy to welcome Chris Hong uh, uh, this morning to uh, give a lecture. And Chris is going to be speaking about the role of the neurosurgeon in clinical trials, a uh, window into the opportunity for phase zero clinical trials, so a topic we're very interested in. Chris is a neurosurgeon scientist who it is under uh, his medical school at The Ohio State, and uh, it was a neurosurgery resident at Yale, finishing that up and now doing an endovascular, um, <laughs> slip of the tongue there, uh, endoscopic and uh, open skull base fellowship at uh, Brigham's and Women's, and uh, continues to be active as a neurosurgeon scientist. And we are delighted to have him here with us this morning. And welcome, Chris, and thank you for uh, coming to speak with us this morning. Thank you, Dr. McDougall, uh, for that kind introduction. And um, good morning, everyone. And thank you again for the opportunity to come visit um, this such a renowned institution as Swedish, and of course, this amazing city of Seattle. Um, I had a great time meeting many of you yesterday and look forward to meeting um, more of the department today. So the uh, focus of my talk, um, again, will be on uh, the role of the neurosurgeon in clinical trials, particularly in the design and impl implementation of uh, early phase zero clinical trials. Um, I have no disclosures. So uh, just before I begin my talk, I just wanted to briefly introduce myself to all of you, um, just from a personal standpoint. I grew up in um, Baltimore, uh, attended the Gilman School, um, and then uh, Subsequently, did my undergrad um, at Harvard. I focused, uh, had a major in uh, human evolution and biology, um, and then attended medical school at the Ohio State. Um, and uh, although I uh, never went to a, a football game, I uh, hope that your uh, Huskies can uh, avenge our loss and take out Michigan the title game <laughs> this year. <laughs> Um, subsequently, I did my residency at Yale, um, which was capped off by my recent graduation um, this past June. Um, I had a phenomenal seven years there, uh, capped off by a uh, you know a wonderful celebration with faculty and co-residents. And currently, I'm a very happy uh, skull base fellow at the Brigham under the tutelage of uh, my mon uh, wonderful mentors, Dr. Smith and uh, Dr. Laws. So uh, despite my East Coast and New England roots, um, I can't say uh, I'm not jealous of what you have here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I've spent a lot of time riding bicycles here in the Pacific Northwest, and I've been very fond of Seattle. So it's a beautiful city with obviously great access to remote nature, and I've made it a point to come back as much as I can. So with that said, um, here's a brief overview of what I'd like to discuss today. Um, so uh, I'd like to start off with just a brief background and some of the limitations of uh, preclinical studies in uh, brain tumors, um, an introduction into phase zero uh, clinical trials, and then some of uh, what just goes into the design of a phase zero clinical trial, particularly in, um, in brain tumors and neuro-oncology. Uh, and then I'd like to go through some of my experience um, with an illustrative case uh, with a, a novel drug um, that was recently studied called uh, BGB290 from the preclinical setting, um, leading all the way up to a uh, recently uh, performed phase both zero and two uh, clinical trial and, uh, and to present those results. So to begin, um, I don't think this audience really needs any introduction to the definition or the structure of clinical trials, but briefly though, I think we, we traditionally think of clinical trials as proceeding from phase one to phase four, in which phase one starts with first in human testing to establish a safe and tolerable dose. This then moves into larger phase two testing to demonstrate efficacy in human patients. And then uh, with phase three, we expand that to a larger patient cohort to demonstrate safety and efficacy in comparison to standard of care. 
And then lastly, phase four explores these long-term effects in patients with uh, the disease of interest. So within our oncology, uh, the vast majority of these clinical trials are phase one through three and are driven by combinations of medical and radiation treatments. As neurosurgeons though, although there are a minor subset of trials uh, directly uh, studying, uh, per, for example, uh, uh, injections into uh, tumors during surgery, our roles I think can otherwise, are otherwise limited to brain uh, tumor clinical trials as the research is heavily focused on development of uh, novel clinical agents, novel pharmacologic agents. So that said, in phase zero clinical trials, there's a window of opportunities for neurosurgeons to investigate the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of new drugs in the perioperative setting and potentially accelerate the testing of these drugs in advanced clinical trials. So as we all know, uh, preclinical studies are vital to studying a drug prior to administration in humans. However, brain, studying brain tumors can be particularly challenging as there's no consensus on the model of choice for creating a brain tumor model. Whether that be, as you can see here in this figure, in vitro cultures, syngenetic models, transgenic animals, or even patient-derived xenografts. Furthermore, uh, drugs that are seemingly validated in the preclinical setting are often hampered by lack of efficacy in human clinical trials, which may be due to failure to replicate the blood-brain barrier, the immune or the tumor microenvironment, intratumoral heterogeneity, among others. So back in March of 2004, the FDA uh, responded to concerns that drug development costs were becoming excessively high, leading to a stagnation in the development of new drugs. So this report was entitled, Innovation Stagnation, Challenge the Opportunity on the Critical Path to New Medical Products. So in response to this, the FDA created the Exploratory Investigational New Drug Mechanism, which is now regarded as a essentially a phase zero clinical trial. So the FDA originally just defined this type of study as a clinical trial that one, is conducted early in phase one, two, involves very limited human exposure, and three, has no therapeutic or diagnostic intent, i.e. it was a screening studies or microdose studies. And then furthermore, they clarified that such exploratory IND studies are conducted prior to the traditional dose escalation, safety and tolerance studies that ordinarily initiate a clinical drug development program. So the duration of dosing in such an exploratory IND study is expected to be limited, about seven days. And then this guidance applies to early phase one clinical trials of investigational new drug and biologic products that assess feasibility for further development of the drug or biologic products. So this new mechanism enables pre-surgical dosing of patients with a particular drug in order to study the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic effects. Essentially, the human metabolism of the drug and its ability to penetrate the tumor and on on-target molecular effects. So this new mechanism could more readily identify potential drug candidates that hold promise for clinical efficacy and therefore move into phase one through three clinical trials. So this recent review published in uh, neurosurgery by uh, Dr. Sinai, who's a, uh, a well-known neurosurgical uh, clinical trialist at the Barrow, highlights some of the goals of these phase zero clinical trials. So as seen here in this table uh, from his uh, review, these include uh, number one, determining whether a mechanism of action defined in non-clinical models is essentially achievable in humans. And two, providing a, uh, a human pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic uh, relationship data for an agent before phase one testing. Three, refining a biomarker assay using human tumor tissues for evaluating, again, the pharmacodynamics and or uh, pharmacodynamics of uh, essentially multiple drugs to develop the best, uh, the best candidate for further testing. 
And then five, uh, also utilizing um, this model to develop uh, model uh, novel imaging probes and evaluate its uh, distribution uh, on target effects in humans. So the original phase zero clinical trial uh, mechanism that was uh, originally proposed by the FDA uh, was conceived with the general um, drug development community in mind. That said, uh, there may be certain modifications for brain tumor patients related to multiple factors. So these include um, a lack of, again, reliable preclinical animal models, um, the risk of uh, obtaining tumor tissue at multiple time points, uh, particularly in uh, brain tumor patients, um, challenges surrounding the blood-brain barrier. So again, this is another table from uh, Dr. Sinai's um, review, but uh, specific modifications, particularly for brain tumor patients in these early phase zero clinical trials may include, uh, so abandoning the uh, microdosing in favor of a higher dosing regimen. So again, this relates to the fact that in brain tumor patients, uh, microdoses may be uh, detectable uh, in plasma using uh, modern analytical methods but uh, in the CNS may be undetectable due to difficulties, um, again, with uh, crossing the blood-brain barrier. So consequently, uh, in phase zero clinical studies, particularly for brain tumor patients, we may need to utilize higher uh, systemic drug treatments for detection, uh, again, to, um, to overcome the, the barriers of the blood-brain barrier. Um, so uh, recent studies have also uh, navigated this challenge using a, a higher dose, essentially a, a subtherapeutic dosing strategy that employs a drug's maximally tolerated dose, but administers this drug um, for as briefly as just a single day. And um, on this specific tactic, uh, although contrary to the conventional microdose design of, uh, of non-CNS phase zero clinical trials maximizes this opportunity for CNS penetration while minimizing the uh, risk of adverse events in phase zero clinical studies for brain tumor patients. Uh, however, this approach does require a uh, phase one study uh, to determine a maximally tolerated um, dose for the drug in advance. Um, some other uh, alterations for uh, phase zero clinical studies, particularly for brain tumor patients, include incorporating CSF um, into the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic analyses, um, adding a phase two component for patients um, that do demonstrate favorable responses for these early PKPD studies. And then also for, uh, importantly, integrating the neurosurgeon into the trial team. So unlike conventional phase zero clinical trials, which may often uh, involve multiple tumor biopsies at different time points before and after drug treatment, uh, in brain tumor patients, only a limited number of tissue samples can be obtained safely given the ethical concerns and potential complications surrounding uh, multiple um, brain surgeries. So therefore, each sample uh, that is obtained needs to be uh, carefully and strategically planned um, in close collaboration with the neurosurgeon. So, um, so uh, with that introduction, um, I'd like to transition uh, to some of my work. Um, actually, sorry, I'd like to go over this briefly. So. Um, Particularly with uh, phase zero clinical trials, um, that can be challenging again to their non-therapeutic nature. So often these phase zero clinical trials are coupled with um, phase two clinical trials, which can uh, actually encourage patient accrual um, as if a patient, as if a, if a drug demonstrates um, favorable uh, tumor penetrance as well as on-target efficacy after PKPD analyses, then we may actually be able to directly graduate these patients into um, a exploratory phase two arm and then um, give essentially further incentive for providers as well as uh, patients to that their tumors may respond to treatment. So again, this is another schematic from 
um, Dr. Sinai's uh, from study, but uh, this essentially shows how a phase zero slash two um, clinical trial can proceed in which uh, patients will initially undergo a phase zero uh, study with PKPD endpoints to assess, again, the, um, the efficacy of the drug in penetrating the tumor as well as the on target effects within one week of surgery. And then those that um, then respond favorably can then uh, be uh, enrolled in a, uh, a phase two exploratory uh, uh, study. So, um, so now I'd like to just proceed to sort of a case example of how um, a an early phase uh, zero uh, clinical trial might proceed and then leading into some of the, or the results from uh, uh, the, again, in a uh, phase two study. So um, this is work that I uh, did um, under my uh, PI, uh, Dr. Bindra, who's a radiation oncologist at Yale. Um, and we studied a uh, novel CNS penetrant PARP inhibitor uh, called uh, BGB290, also known as uh, Pemiparib. So our lab in um, recent years have demonstrated that the oncometabolite R2 hydroxyglutarate, which is produced by uh, the mutant uh, IDH protein, uh, inhibits a family of alpha ketoglutarate dependent dioxygenases, which facilitates a homologous recombination after double strand DNA breaks. So thus, uh, high levels of R2 hydroxyglutarate suppresses uh, homologous recombination, which essentially renders cells susceptible to PARP in inhibition. This concept uh, mirrors the current uh, therapeutic strategy of utilizing PARP inhibitors in patients with uh, BRCA mutant cancers. So thus, uh, our uh, IDH mutant cancers may be particularly sensitized to PARP inhibitors exhibiting this, uh, quote unquote, what we call it a uh, a brachinus type phenotype. So to understand the efficacy of PARC inhibitors with uh, the brachinus phenotype, this is sort of a simplified background of a DNA uh, damage repair. So after a single strand break in, uh, in DNA, PARP is recruited to the site and subsequently undergoes um, parlation for enzyme activation. So subsequently, uh, the parlated enzyme recruits various DNA uh, repair complexes to the site of the break for base excision repair. So when PARP is inhibited uh, pharmacologically, normal uh, base excision repair cannot occur, and uh, single-strand breaks may subsequently be converted to double-strand breaks. Uh, so in the presence of normal homologous recombination, uh, the double strand break can be repaired with high fidelity. So however, in uh, BRCA mutated cancers and what we have now shown um, in oncometabolite induced brca and IDH mutant tumors, uh, normal homologous recombination cannot proceed, leading to alternative uh, modalities of double strand DNA break repair that are highly error prone and can therefore lead to genomic instability and uh, cell death. So currently, the following uh, PARP inhibitors have been approved by the FDA for treatment of various systemic cancers, um, including germline BRCA mutated cancers. So while all these drugs inhibit PARP via preventing parlation, those that exhibit PARP trapping may be more cytotoxic as single, uh, single agents and reflects the, the characteristic of the drug that traps the PARP enzyme bound to the damaged DNA. So to date, uh, PARP inhibitors have not been approved in CNS tumors in part uh, due to their relatively poor penetration across the blood brain barrier. So as you can see here, the most um, CNS penetrant of these drugs is uh, valiparib. But uh, unfortunately, this drug uh, demonstrates the poorest PARP trapping uh, potency and has therefore not been, um, has not demonstrated any significant clinical efficacy in human tr clinical trials. So uh, with that, BGB290, uh, which is the focus of uh, our study, is a relatively new PARP inhibitor um, that has demonstrated potent PARP trapping uh, capability and high CNS penetrance relative to other uh, FDA-approved PARP inhibitors. 
So as such, we hypothesized that uh, IDH1 and 2 mutant gliomas can be targeted by uh, therapeutic combinations of PARP inhibition with standard of care uh, DNA damaging therapies, uh, including uh, temozolomide and radiation. So um, here, uh, as outlined here, you can see that uh, we first, uh, our first goal was to essentially test a therapeutic uh, synergy utilizing BGB-290 with temozolomide and radiation uh, for IDH1 mutant uh, gliomas in vitro. So here's just some of our um, preclinical data. So uh, first we utilized isogenic pairs of IDH1 mutant and wild type cell lines. Um, we subjected them to short-term viability assays after essentially five days of drug exposure, uh, as well as long-term clonogenic assays, uh, which involved 14 days of drug exposure. So you can see here in panel A, as expected, we saw a, essentially a nearly seven-fold increased sensitivity to temozolomide in uh, U87 mutant versus wild type cells, which is, uh, which is of course expected uh, given the, uh, the sensitivity, as we all know, of, um, of uh, IDH mutant gliomas to TMZ, and this was recapit recapitulated by data again in long-term clonogenic survival assays in panel B. Um, in panel C, uh, we actually did not see as much of a sensitivity in temozolomide in uh, HCT116 cells, but uh, this was expected given that these cells are uh, highly expressed MGMT, um, reflecting again the, the clinical sensitivity of uh, temozolomide of uh, two MGMT methylated tumors. Um, so prior to uh, utilizing uh, BGB290 in these uh, same cell lines, we performed an ELISA uh, to measure um, correlation levels, essentially to demonstrate that there was a, a dose-dependent inhibition of correlation levels in vitro with even uh, nanomolar concentrations of uh, BGB290 in um, U87 cells. Uh, this was after uh, essentially uh, 24 hours of exposure to the drug. So then uh, we performed the uh, same set of short-term and long-term viability assays um, in these cell lines with BGB290. So you can see here panel A and B both demonstrate preferential killing of IDH mutant U87 cells with uh, BGB290 in both uh, short and long-term viability and long-term viability assays respectively. And then in panel C, the same effect is seen uh, with a, a short-term viability assay in HCT116 cells. And then in panel D, uh, this same preferential uh, targeting of IDH mutant cells versus wild type is seen with uh, Olaparib, which is a uh, clinically approved PARP inhibitor, um, which is currently used to treat pa patients with uh, BRCA mutated uh, cancers, among others. So then we proceeded to treat these cells with dual therapies to essentially explore uh, potential synergistic relationships uh, between BGB290 and temozolomide. So IDH1 uh, wild type and mutant cells were exposed to incremental doses of uh, temozolomide and BGB290 for five days, and then we uh, uh, measured cell viability. So synergy between these two uh, treatments uh, can be assessed with synergy scores calculated uh, via standard uh, open access software. So in which yellow to red shows antagonism, while blue illustrates treatment synergy. So in these representative uh, examples of experiments, uh, you can see that combination therapy with BGB290 and temozolomide and IDH wild type cells in panel A uh, did not reveal any significant uh, synergism. However, in contrast, in the same treatment IDH1 mutant cells in panel B, uh, we found some uh, potential uh, synergistic relationships, particularly at uh, lower doses of BGB290 and temozolomide. So interestingly, in the uh, HCT116 cells, uh, we found profound synergy with uh, BGB290 and temozolomide treatment. Uh, for both the wild type and the IDH1 mutant cells, uh, which is notable given that you know these cells are uh, resistant to temozolomide, as shown in the short-term viability assay uh, that I presented um, earlier. 
Um, furthermore, the synergy occurs at lower doses of temozolomide and BGB um, in panel B in the IDH mutant cells, uh, reflecting again the same observation seen in the uh, U87 cells in the prior slide. So this raises the possible notion that lower doses of temozolomide could be considered with the addition of a PARP inhibitor in IDH mutant uh, cancers. So then we uh, further validated uh, dose-dependent inhibition after monotherapy with temozolomide um, in panel A or with BGB-290 in, in panel B um, in a patient-derived xenograft line of a IDH1 a mutant um, oligodendroglioma cell line. And then again, utilizing the same uh, synergy assay employed with uh, the uh, immortalized cell lines, we found synergistic uh, interactions between BGB-290 and temozolomide at relatively lower doses of BGB-290 and across a, variety, a range of doses with uh, temozolomide. And then um, these are the same experiments um, performed now with a combination of BGB-290 and radiation. Um, so you can see here in panel A, uh, there's preferential targeting of IDH1 mutant U87s versus, um, U8, uh, versus wild type at higher radiation doses of two and five gray in a long-term uh, clonogenic survival assay. And then you can see in uh, panels B and C that we performed the same synergy experiment uh, in paired U87 wild type and mutant cells. Uh, and you can see that in, uh, in panel B in the wild type cells, there's uh, actually strong antagonism versus in panel C, um, we found some um, synergistic relationships um, in the IDH uh, mutant cells. So then our second aim of uh, our preclinical study, we sought to um, demonstrate the, the pharmacokinetics of BGB-290 uh, in an in vivo rat model to show that um, this drug could have a favorable CNS penetrance that would then uh, support further testing in human patients. So in this experiment, uh, we injected uh, RG2 cells, which is an intrinsic rat glioma cell line in the right frontal cortex of, uh, of rats and treated them for one week with a daily uh, oral administration of BGB-290 twice a day. Um, so these were bioluminescence imaging cells, which allowed us to monitor tumor growth and formation after injection, and at the time of sacrifice to aid in uh, tumor dissection. So here you can see in panel A, um, this is a representative bioluminescence image of two rats with uh, tumors large enough to then initiate BGP-290 treatment. And then you can see here in panel B, uh, the BLI signal in the right frontal cortex after harvesting the brain at time of sacrifice. And then in panel C, this is an example of a tumor specimen excised from uh, the whole brain uh, exhibiting a BLI signal as well as a normal adjacent brain that lacks the BLI signal. And then subsequently we uh, sent paired uh, tumor, normal brain and plasma specimens from the animals um, to one of our collaborators uh, who has established a ELISA technique for measuring uh, the pharmacokinetics of drug activity. So then we collected these specimens uh, from two different time points after a last uh, drug administration, two hours and eight hours um, after, uh, after the last drug administration. Uh, we also treated these animals with uh, two different drug concentrations, three and six milligrams uh, per kilogram. And then uh, results from the uh, pharmacokinetic studies, as you can see here, demonstrated higher levels of unbound drug uh, in tumors versus normal brain, as well as expected higher levels of drug in animals treated with higher doses of the drug and at earlier time points uh, at two hours. And uh, notably, we found a favorable CNS penetrance of BGB-290 into the CNS uh, with a tumor plasma ratio of greater than 0.2 uh, at both low and high doses and at the early and late uh, time points. So a ratio of uh, 0.2 is generally considered as a, a threshold for acceptable CNS penetrant drugs. And notably, we found that the drug preferentially penetrates the tumor compared to adjacent brains, suggesting that oral uh, administration of BGP-290 may lead to 
limited off-target effects. So uh, in conclusion from this uh, preclinical study of BGP-290, we found that PARP inhibition uh, with BGP-290 confers sensitivity to both temozolomide and radiation in IDH uh, mutant tumors versus wild type in vitro. Uh, that BGB-290 selectively penetrates the CNS preferentially into the tumor with favorable uh, brain to plasma ratios. And so that BGB-290 may be a promising PARP inhibitor in patients with IDH1 and 2 mutant gliomas that may uh, confer enhanced sensitivity to standard of care treatment with uh, temozolomide and radiation. So with that, I'll transition to um, what essentially uh, helped support uh, initiation of a phase zero to two clinical trial um, studying BGB-290 and TMZ, uh, or temozolomide in patients with recurrent IDH1 and 2 mutant gliomas. Uh, so this study, uh, ABTC-1810, uh, uh, or sorry, 1810, um, involved uh, daily BGB-290 oral administration, um, BID, with uh, 20 milligrams uh, daily of temozolomide, which is lower than the, the dosing uh, according to the STEP protocol. And in line with our in vitro data, that synergy with uh, BGB-290 and temozolomide may occur at lower doses of, temozol uh, of temozolomide and therefore may spare uh, myelosuppression sometimes seen in these patients. So this uh, trial was led by my PI, um, Dr. Bindra, as well as Dr. Schiff at UVA. And uh, this was a multi-center study uh, comprised of uh, 11 cancer centers across the US. You can see here, uh, this is a schematic of uh, essentially how this study was performed, um, initially with a dose finding phase one portion, and then followed by a phase zero slash two uh, portion um, and with the surgical arm being the phase zero portion. Uh, to study the drug pharmacokinetics. So the phase one component utilized a three plus three design, as you can see in, the, in this table above, uh, with a target dose limiting toxicity rate of under uh, 33%. So um, essentially this is a, a clinical trial design in which uh, patients are enrolled um, so that uh, you enter essentially three patients um, at the same uh, dose schedule, and then if there's no um, toxicities and you can roll additional patients sequentially um, to essentially ensure that uh, the um, dose limiting toxicity rate uh, remains under uh, 33% or one third. Um, the BGB-290 dose uh, was again um, 60 milligrams twice a day. So this was based on prior uh, human data that was collected in other solid tumors, um, not uh, non not uh, brain tumors. And the temozolomide dose was uh, 20 milligrams daily um, to be given in 28-day uh, cycles. So if there was any uh, unacceptable adverse events, particularly uh, we anticipated uh, hematologic toxicity, um, the planned uh, dose de-escalation schedule uh, was to reduce the temozolomide frequency as shown here in the bottom panel. So initially we're gonna start out with uh, giving temozolomide um, every day for the 28 day cycle. And again, if patients demonstrated uh, any uh, uh, adverse events, um, then uh, the, the temozolomide dose frequency would be reduced on a biweekly basis. So we enrolled uh, seven patients in this initial uh, phase one portion. Um, these patients, uh, four of them had anaplastic astrocytoma, two had anaplastic oligodendroglioma, one had a, a glioblastoma. Uh, only one patient had a dose limiting uh, toxicity uh, during the first cycle, which was a grade three neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. Another two had a grade two neutropenia. Um, so essentially um, none of them had to undergo um, dose de-escalation and these data then supported um, further study of uh, BGB-290, uh, 60 milligrams BID with temozolomide, 20 milligrams daily as uh, the dosages for the uh, phase two arm. So here's uh, a brief um, outline of our phase two uh, study. So um, here are the eligibility criteria. So patients had to have a known uh, diagnosis of a IDH1 mutant 
grade two or three uh, glioma, also with known uh, 1P19Q um, co-deletion and MGMT status. Uh, they had to have failed at least one chemo uh, regimen, so they were divided into arm A, which was the high-risk group. They had to have uh, failed at least two alkylator regimens. And then arm B, which uh, we considered the lower risk group, who had only failed one alkylator and um, were at least uh, 12 months out from their last treatment. And you can see some of the other um, eligibility criteria below. So um, the patients, again, were administered uh, the, the dosages of BGB-290 and uh, temozolomide that were established from the initial phase one clinical trial. And the primary endpoint was an objective uh, radiographic response based on the RANO criteria. Um, so this study was uh, powered to enroll patients with the listed um, uh, null and alternative hypotheses percentages, uh, as you can see here, which basically amounted to 15 patients in arm A and 24 patients in arm B. So the secondary endpoint for success um, was a 50% or greater decline in flare uh, volume growth rate after six months compared to uh, six months prior um, or in, uh, for 50% uh, of patients in arm A and 60% of patients in arm B. So then additionally, uh, here's the, uh, the phase zero uh, surgical arm to study the drug pharmacokinetics. So patients who were uh, eligible for re-resection took BGP-290 uh, daily at 60 milligrams twice a day for seven days leading up to surgery. And then on the morning of surgery, they took a dose and approximately two to four hours later, samples of the enhancing and non-enhancing tumor as well as blood were harvested. And then they were sent to our collaborators uh, for uh, pharmacokinetic analysis. So uh, here are the patient demographics uh, demonstrating as planned. We had 15 patients enrolled in arm A. Uh, 24 patients in arm B, so the median uh, age was 45. 56% uh, of patients were male. The median KPS was 90. So the median number of relapses for patients in arm A was two, one for arm, for arm B. Uh, 1P19Q uh, code deletion was detected in 60% of patients in arm A, 75% of patients in arm B and MGMT uh, methylation was in 60% of patients in arm A and 79% of patients in arm B. So the vast majority of patients um, had a prior history of surgery, uh, radiation, chemotherapy, uh, with temozolomide being the most uh, common alkylator followed by a, a PCV uh, nitrosurea-based therapies for, uh, for patients in arm A. So uh, unfortunately, we did not have any confirmed um, radiographic responses in arm A and arm B. So as such, neither arm uh, met the threshold for additional patient accrual. Um, that said, as a secondary endpoint, um, four patients in arm A and seven patients in arm B did demonstrate a decrease in growth rate uh, greater than 50%. So unfortunately, the other finding from this uh, study was that uh, there was a greater than expected uh, rate of hematologic toxicities um, of a grade three or higher, leading to approximately one third of patients uh, discontinuing the study treatment for this or other reasons. So 31% of patients uh, experienced uh, severe neutropenia, followed by 28% with anemia, 17% uh, with uh, lymphopenia, and 10% with uh, thrombocytopenia. And then uh, here's just some of the overall survival and progression-free survival um, curves, but the estimated, the estimated uh, median progression-free survival was 5.8 months in arm A, um, 11.3 months in arm B, and then uh, we didn't assess uh, overall survival given uh, this study was uh, terminated early and most patients were still alive at the end of the study. And then here's the, um, the pharmacokinetic uh, data from uh, eight patients that we did enroll in the, uh, the surgical phase zero arm. So we found um, excellent uh, tumor penetration with, a pharma with pharmacologically relevant concentrations in both non-enhancing and enhancing tumors, as you can see here in panel A. 
the median uh, unbound tumor concentration is approximately 30-fold the uh, in vitro IC50 for PARP inhibition. Um, so again, demonstrating excellent um, uh, uh, pharmacologically uh, relevant concentrations of the tumor or of the drug in the tumor. Um, also, we found um, excellent uh, uh, tumor penetration um, again here with uh, median unbound tumor uh, to plasma ratios of 0.98 and 0.92, as you can see here in, uh, in panel B. And then here in panel C, the uh, unbound fraction uh, in the tumor was larger than in the plasma, leading to greater uh, bioavailability of this drug in the CNS compared to the periphery. So um, these data uh, has been uh, from both uh, from the preclinical work uh, spanning to the phase one and then the phase zero slash two clinical trials um, has been uh, presented at uh, the Society of uh, Neuro-Oncology um, in recent years. So um, in conclusion um, from this, uh, from our clinical trial, we concluded that uh, BGB290 um, can achieve pharmacologically relevant uh, concentrations in both enhancing and non-enhancing tumors. That BGB290 and uh, low-dose temozolomide um, unfortunately failed to produce rano radiographic responses and uh, also led to cumulative toxicity, particularly uh, hematologic toxicities, um, more than we anticipated. And uh, that actually, though, uh, uh, reflecting our secondary um, endpoint, that we found um, some prolonged tumor stabilization in a subset of patients, and subsequently, we are looking to uh, explore uh, particular biomarkers in these patients that may have led to um, subs uh, this uh, demonstrated um, reduction in tumor, uh, tumor growth. And then um, just some conclusions, some personal conclusions as a um, young neurosurgeon hoping to embark on a neurosurgical uh, oncology career. Um, so phase zero surgical clinical trials in brain tumors are promising avenues um, for both uh, incentivizing patient enrollment and to accelerate uh, clinical study in human patients. Um, and given that the limitations uh, and risk of accessing tissue as, uh, as what we do on a daily basis, that neurosurgeons uh, clearly play an integral role in the design and execution of these early phase of clinical trials. Um, and then just some personal reflections I've learned uh, over the years, particularly in residency, um, to always be available, to stay humble, it's a team sport. And then uh, something I've learned, especially more recently from my fellowship director, that um, it's always wise to treat every patient like they're your own family member. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Bindra, um, my PI at Yale, and members of our lab who were instrumental in helping me perform this research, um, the Society of Neuro-Oncology um, for both the opportunities to present our work as well as um, to uh, uh, personally for myself to attend their clinical trial course um, and to learn uh, what goes behind uh, designing such a clinical trial as uh, ABTC uh, 1810. And then of course, I'd like to also acknowledge my current fellowship director, Dr. Smith, uh, members of our lab, the Computational Neuroscience Outcome Center. Uh, it's been a phenomenal clinical and research experience so far at the Brigham, and I hope I can share some of that work with you as well in the near future. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Let's uh, open it up for questions. Is this microphone working? Okay. All I was going to say is this is an excellent talk, and I think that as uh, neuro oncology clinical trials move forward, um, I think there's a consensus in the field that we have to um, do more of these phase zero trials so we can have more flexibility and uh, ability to um, move quickly from one success or failure to the next one. And I think this is, uh, all, all I can say is this is about the most um, elegant example of a molecular finding that can be converted into a laboratory finding that can be then tested in a human. So I think this is a 
just a great example of moving the um, field forward through a, a phase zero, phase one trial with um, a mechanism to be tested. And I want to just congratulate you on nice work. Thank you. Hey, Sorry, Chris Cameron, I, I, I've got a question. Um, you, you know, it looks so promising, then it's dis, then it's disappointing. There's a couple of things that I, that I really didn't understand, like why in the synergy uh, phase of it were some of the lower doses more synergistic than the higher doses? And and were there, in retrospect, anything that, that you can see that explain or account for or would predict the, the, uh, the lack of effect ultimately? Yeah, I think um, so with the, so the synergy algorithm is designed to sort of predict a, um, so it's not so much, um, you know, when you expose tumor cells to both high doses of the drug as well as temozolomide, we have higher cell killing. Um, but we were trying to find essentially uh, uh, the, the purpose of the synergistic um, algorithm is to determine an optimal temozolomide dose in which um, we were essentially trying to limit as much of the temozolomide as possible. Um, given that uh, BGB290 in um, prior human data for other solid tumors has shown some um, hematologic toxicity. So we were trying to essentially do um, uh, what we termed microdosing with the temozolomide. Um, that said, I think, um, you know, we didn't, in our preclinical data did not, um, in, in the in vivo models, we didn't assess uh, hematologic toxicity in the animals. So we weren't measuring, um, you know, their, um, their, their uh, platelet counts, their, their lymphocyte counts and, and such. So, uh, you know, the, the, the testing in human patients was the first. Um, and, you know, we didn't see that with uh, in the phase one study, but the phase one study was only limited to seven patients. We had one patient with um, grade three or greater um, dose limited uh, toxicities, but then when we then essentially expanded it to a larger patient cohort, then the hematologic toxic toxicities manifested and we had to stop the study early, so. And, and for this agent, um, what's happened in other uh, areas like is, this, is it continuing to be used and explored in in other uh, cancers? And it, it is, it's... yeah. In, in solid tumors, um, it has been uh, it has been explored in more um, advanced clinical trials. Um, I have to look back and see what the additional data is, but it, I think it, it has expanded to phase three, phase two, phase three trials in solid tumors um, with I think more favorable uh, toxicities. So. Do you think there's an opportunity to uh, continue working with this agent for uh, CNS tumors, but without temozolomide? I think um, so. The at least based on the mechanism of the drug, um, you need to have. So the drug itself is the is the PARP inhibitor, but then um, you need to have some sort of a DNA damaging uh, agent. So whether that's with temozolomide with radiation or essentially another uh, PARP inhibitor um, that uh, maybe, you know, that can find, that can be a more synergistic relationship with these DNA damaging agents um, that might be able to reduce some of the dose limiting toxicity. Um, that might be the future. So uh, for now, I think uh, trying to find a, a probably a, a different PARP inhibitor um, that uh, may lead to reduced uh, hematologic toxicity is, it's probably the way to go for the future, so. But it's, it seems like that pathway, though, is, is a setup for the hematological complications. So what's, what's happening in the solid tumors? Why are, why are they seeing less? I think they're using um, different uh, alkylator chemotherapies, so not the standard uh, agents that we use with um, the STIP protocol with temozolomide radiation, so. It's beautiful work, and uh, I mean, it's just an exciting pathway, uh, long, hard pathway, but um, a bit of a shortcut to what, what yeah. we typically do. And so it, it's uh, it's exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's been a um, you know, unfortunately, I think that 
the 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 end result of the study itself, um, you know, is a little disappointing. But I think that the whole process of, uh, you know, the, the preclinical work to um, accelerating into a phase zero and then to a phase two clinical trial, I think, is really um, taught me sort of and given given me incentive to really try to. Um, pursue additional studies like this, um, you know, as a neurosurgeon, I think it's um, vitally important that, you know, as neurosurgeons that we participate, in, particularly in an early phase zero uh, clinical trial design and um, to accelerate, you know, the, the development of novel drug compounds um, in our patients, so. Absolutely. We have a question Any from the panelists. A couple of questions from the chat. Oh, Go ahead. I also had a question. Oh, sorry. So beautiful talk. You know, so they constant battle to either liquid biopsy or biopsy prior to treatment and then we do surgery to look at the new penetrance and see what we're doing. This has been ongoing for the last few decades. The problem that I see and I would like to hear what you your thoughts are, let's say we have drug Have they uh, looked at drug resistance after treatment in brain tumors specifically? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Can you just repeat the question? Yeah, sure. So again, um, so the question was uh, looking at um, essentially uh, what are the reasons for uh, patients that develop drug resistance um, after treatment with these drugs um, like VGB290. So, uh, no, our lab hasn't really looked at drug resistance, um, you know, just because it's at least in the preclinical setting, it's hard to sort of uh, recapitulate that, that clinical setting in an animal model. Um, and we haven't, uh, we haven't had any patients that have developed, you know, drug resistance um, because our, our study essentially was terminated um, rather early. Um, that said, I think, uh, you know, there is a role for studying patients after the fact that they've been exposed to this drug long term. So although we haven't had patients that have um, developed drug resistance, we did have a, a, a subset of patients who at least demonstrated um, uh, temporary tumor growth arrest. Uh, based on flare imaging. So I think there is a role for at least um, getting the neurosurgeon essentially getting involved um, at uh, later time points um, to sample these tumors and then to determine, um, to subject them to studies for biomarkers that assess, you know, why they uh, may be exhibiting essentially um, uh, tumor growth arrest or in, in uh, cases that you were mentioning, if we had patients who developed drug resistance, then uh, performing additional um, pharmacodynamic and essentially analyses, so on target effects, so. Thanks again, hey, Dr. Cameron, uh, um, Dr. Uh, Bonham, one of our neuro-oncologists, uh, he's on and uh, he applauds you for, again, a great talk showing an um, awesome example of rational design and translational medicine. The question he had was, uh, what do you think we can do to improve our ability to predict positive trials? Um, that is, what can we do to better select drug candidates? Um, thank you uh, for that, um, that nice uh, compliment. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, with the in vivo work that we're doing, um, we were limited 
so we did our we did a pharmacokinetic study again showing that the the drug uh, penetrates the CNS. However, um, with our pharmacodynamic studies, um, we were limited to I think just doing a uh, a parlation study, which um, essentially showed that, as expected, as a PARP inhibitor, um, that uh, the drug is reducing uh, parlation levels, which you would expect. Um, unfortunately, you know this was also uh, work that was. Uh, performed uh, during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we were a bit limited in our uh, actual ability to perform these in vivo experiments in animals when unfortunately the animal facility itself was um, shut down because of COVID. So I think that um, additional pharmacodynamic studies in the preclinical setting to demonstrate on target effects of the drug, uh, both um, Drug administration with the drug as a monotherapy, but more importantly, uh, in combination with um, uh, the DNA damaging agents like temozolomide radiation, um, would have uh, probably uh, more uh, robustly uh, supported or you know uh, predicted the outcomes of our uh, human clinical trial results. And the follow-up question was, uh, was there any analysis of the induced DNA damage? Um, that is the TMB or uh, uh, DS breaks, double-stranded breaks in the treated tissue to confirm intended uh, action of the drug? Yeah, so not in the clinical trial, not in the human patients, but um, so there was a subset of patients, again, that did actually demonstrate some um, temporary tumor uh, growth or rest uh, in the six months. Um, after treatment versus the six months prior. Um, so there is, uh, there are plans um, in the future to perform uh, some uh, pharmacodynamic analyses of these, uh, the, of the patients, of the tumor specimens from these patients. And then again, uh, congratulations from uh, our colleagues in Libya. I congratulate your work. Thank you. Hey, uh, Chris Cameron, can you hear me? This is Chris Lloyd. I think we're at time there. I really want to thank you for a beautiful.